starting out with straight facts I don't lie in my raps, Hunter Biden smoke The Democrats know that, Biden ain't with Jack The name is Barack, he a little B like the pack The earth might be flat Welcome back, welcome back Where is everybody? At home? Yes. Yep. Yep. Multicultural broadcast brought to you by Andrew Says. Thanks, everybody, for joining. First time we've all been together. Um, Is that true? I think so. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. Um, And we are hot off the presses of uh, social media blitz from the government. I can hear myself from somebody's stuff. I don't know whose that is, but... um, it's a good time. We'll just pretend it's not there. Uh, <laughs> did you guys see? This is the thing that I knew that I was going to get at least John and Rep on was this new stuff coming out about DeSantis's campaign, basically turning on him anonymously. It's kind of cowardly, but did you guys see any of that? Uh, no, actually, before we went live and you mentioned that, that was the first I'd heard about it. It's um, the yeah, Daily... I've heard, or I read an article... I think there were several articles written by people formerly a part of the campaign that were mentioning how awful it was and that they just like couldn't salvage it. So they just gave up. <laughs> Here's the one I saw. It was daily caller. Now I couldn't find their article for, for whatever reason, but it says much of the blame fell on the candidate himself. IE big Ron. Is anybody else hearing a hiss? Slightly. Yeah. That's Vincenzo. Yeah. And I mute him. It's uh, it's him. Um, he's upset. Let's put the screen on him while he figures this out. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Everything looks fine here. Okay, echo. There can, it is. I guess. What's the date? Uh, what is it like? Ten fourteen or something? Is this ten fourteen all over again? Everywhere you I come, it. everywhere I go, there are. There, I just bring it with me. You That's fixed it. Do. Something you did fixed it. All right, so um, Daily Caller, the candid- the blame fell on the candidate himself, Ron DeSantis, and his wife, one former never back... Was that the name of his campaign, Never Back Down? Yeah, There's and he backed back down, down, so... <laughs> didn't, didn't age well. who, the official, who remains fond of the governor, said that the candidate appeared upright because uptight because that's just who he is. Let's face it, Ron just hates, and honestly, I love the governor. I have nothing bad to say about him, but he does just hate people, the former official said. That's uh, that's not good, but, like, you well, don't hate him, but you're willing to say that he hates people? I guess it's anonymous. That's pretty weak, though, to say that anonymously. That's honestly pretty true, and I think on point, though, because... A lot of people have marked up his failure in the cycle to say it was because, oh, his campaign was poorly run or this bad person. That, but I think when you actually just look at how he was on the campaign trail, I mean, let's just face it. Yeah, the guy did have a charisma problem. The guy has a little bit lacking of the it factor. And that's not... I actually basically agree with what his own super PAC said there. Like, that's not an indignation on who he he who he was as governor and the things he's gotten done but let's face it when you're running for president national scale and all of that uh that stuff matters and i don't think it in the end yes i think he got manipulated by a lot of bad people to run and around the campaign but i think that's pretty on point that the real problem was him right is just his lack of being able to inspire people, uh, you know, I, I think he's he struggles to sell a vision. He struggled to sell a dream. And that's why this past cycle, when he was already the governor, he, he could just say, hey, I got this done. I have this track record done. That was easy for him. But in terms of selling a dream, a vision for the future, which you kind of have to do when you're not an incumbent president, you're trying to get on the map. I think that's his problem. I think that's also why he struggled so much in 2018. But you know, when he has a record to run on, he does a little better. But yeah, I don't think he likes people either. That, that's just what I seem <laughs> to have seen. They uh, they went on here to say that they had a summer layoffs. They were apparently mishandled. The campaign tried to recover morale with a staff-wide happy hour just moments later, which is after they fired a bunch of people, to keep the staffers that they'd managed to keep happy. They asked those of us that weren't being laid off to leave the office and then did a mass firing and then brought everyone back later that afternoon and then had like a happy hour. 
They were like, oh, yeah, morale is really bad. We just fired like 50 people. Let's do a happy hour. It was weird. It was out of touch. There's a lack of empathy, I think, from at least the original leadership team. That was really consistent throughout my time there. I think there's another thing. Um, the ineffectual communic. This is where I think it hits home. The ineffectual communication strategy and mishandling of hostile press wasn't limited to the campaign itself. Uh, Perrine was allegedly afraid to do non-friendly media hits, multiple sources told the Daily Caller. She's the only director of communications I've ever encountered who's afraid to actually communicate, like deathly afraid of it. She hates to be challenged. Now, did you guys, I'm going to go ahead and say I kind of got the idea that they didn't know how to properly handle um, like criticism from people that they probably thought were on their side. I saw a lot of um, creators who will remain unnamed. Um, just being like, this is a really oh, weird you strategy. Have to, you have to name them. You must name the creators. We must. John Doyle, um, <laughs> Andrew says, Red Eagle Patriot, um, and the the people who referred to a woman as Plastic Face, I believe, was one. Oh, that was me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Christina Peshaw. Yeah, so, no, she, so she looks of plastic. She's not a real person. <laughs> so a lot of the stuff and was you know, Twitter wars, I thought, and Twitter beefs. And then they just kind of, you know, went, instead of going high, they went low, as Hillary Clinton might want them to want them to do. Did you guys notice that? Well, they were terminally online. That's their entire campaign. They spent their entire campaign uh, freaking out because some, like, second-rate pro-Trump influencers were saying things that they didn't like. And they weren't talking to the voters of Iowa. DeSantis, whenever he talked, it'd be like awkward, bobblehead chat gpt and as a result that's what happened he got 20 percent. he's put all of his eggs in that basket and fell in the polls the more exposure he got so i mean yeah it was a terminally online campaign and you're right they did not understand that criticism is not all you know in bad faith they got a lot of criticism even from their own side and they just said oh no these people they're off the wagon any like DeSantis supporter who leaves even the ones now that are supporting trump instead of holding out like some of these people are attacking them on a, on the daily still it's crazy but yeah it is a cult these are the people that say trump has the cult well no they have the cult except their cult like is surrounding some guy without a personality so i don't even know why it even exists other than to subvert trump and that seems to be what it is right now because that's all they focus on all these people they actually said here that um she'd freak out and yell at young staffers to tears. I mean, young staffers crying because uh, communications woman's yelling at them is kind of weak as well. But they said she would randomly cry in her office if she didn't get her way. Another former Trump campaign staffer. <laughs> What's so funny about that? I remember one time in the studio, you know, a young girl. It who's sounds working... a lot like uh, Bill Mitchell, you know. Mm. Yeah. I remember one time in the studio, you know, a young girl who was working in there on the studio team. She just made her cry because she was so nervous for an interview that she started screaming at her. I mean, like, I don't know about that stuff. You you talk to somebody anonymously about the campaign you're working on. And you're just like the campaign communications director was mean and she made people cry. Like people are going to cry. This is just what's going to happen, I think. I, I mean, this is what happens when you employ like women uh, to work on political campaigns, honestly, like because if you tell a story to a guy like, yeah, dude, the office is so toxic. People are crying. They're probably, like, oh, my <laughs> gosh, that must be terrible. I've worked at Subway with women and they cry. I mean, you work in a political campaign. They just cry. It's what they do, especially these like young wannabe politico types. They cry over like the littlest instances. And those are the types of people largely who are going to be attracted to the DeSantis campaign because people who are like real actors who are competent are going to want to go with the winning horse because they want to work their way up the ladder. And that's Donald Trump or people who have a personal, um, let's say misalignment with Trump and with his policies and his revolution, they would probably back like the Nikki Haley horse, like somebody who is much more like, okay, full establishment going to have access to those networks and to those advantages because someone like DeSantis is like, we're trying to be like more in the system than Trump to get the benefits from that. But then we're also trying to outflank Trump from the right by focusing more on the culture war stuff. Um, there was no like real coherent message to even his existence as a political figure, much less his campaign, because as Vince pointed out, you know, Donald Trump comes out and he says, we're going to make America great again. We're going to build the wall. We're going to do all these different things. That's like a vision. That's like something you can get behind. 
Uh, and, and DeSantis was much more like, well, we just don't like what the woke is doing. We don't like what's going on with Disney. We, we are anti-Disney, anti-woke. And so much of the right struggles with this framing issue where we have to be able to stand uh, independently of the left and believe in what we believe in simply because of its goodness by itself. It can't just be this sort of counter leftism where we don't really know what we would want in a vacuum, but we know at least we don't like what the trannies are doing because it's annoying or X, Y, Z. Uh, and I think DeSantis's campaign struggled with that from the get go, because as Rep pointed out, they were terminally online. They launched in a Twitter space, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there was no, the only good thing from a uh, content perspective is them being terminally online created a lot of interesting things, such as like their Achilles heel being uh, GOP Josh, 16 year old. <laughs> that was awesome. That was like the best part of it for me. But yeah, there was never, there was never a real shot. Somebody was trolling me the other day saying, Andrew, when are you going to be on the G- GOP Josh's uh, podcast? When are you gonna get it's not call? a troll. Real, it's yeah, a real it's, a real, it's a real podcast. podcast. No, I mean, they were saying that I'm not good enough for GOP that. Josh. It's I don't so, think any well, of then, us are good get good. GOP Josh. GOP I'm, Josh is like top of the line. It's like the most annoying fucking thing is hearing these people, oh, I'm going to go on the GOP Josh show. Like, like as if that's not like prime time. Like, like imagine being like, hey, I hear I might go on Tucker Carlson later. Like, do you think, you think you're better than GOP Josh? GOP Josh would, would rhetorically <laughs> lockpick you into killing yourself like Hannibal Lecter. He would, he would hit you with words you've never even heard before. He would analyze <laughs> your life with such depth and nuance and, and political inform information. Uh, that, that you would just like you would you would retreat to the northern parts of Canada where there's not even <laughs> civilization. You would just you would just hide forever because you would embarrass I, you so badly. I but, think the last time you were on about GOP Josh that way with me again, you don't know the first thing about it. Well, I wasn't actually, but I think the last time we mentioned him when you were on, and then he messaged me after, and he's like, "Great show with John." I was like, "Thanks," and he just just says, "LOL," and then doesn't follow me back. I, I think he might now, but he's got so many power moves in his arsenal, yes. I can't keep yes. up with it. Yeah, um, it's funny you mentioned the online thing, and uh, Rep was definitely right about it because they're talking about here. I found the article. Um, everyone when they launched on the Twitter space. Everyone was eating and having drinks and chatting and trying to listen to the Twitter spaces. And then the tech problems were there. And so in the room, it was definitely awkward. Everyone's like, oh, we're back. Oh, we're not. Did we miss anything? Like, that's the sort of thing where you're just like a bunch of people who are just like, it'll be really cool if we do this on Twitter spaces and Elon will love us for it. And then it just doesn't get executed. And you're just like, okay, how many people did we miss the chance to um, tell about our campaign launch by this this f up. We'll say early in the podcast. Like, why do you think that that was the avenue they went through? Because they're too online. They are not aligned with reality. They exist on Twitter, and so in their mind, it, it makes sense. It would be like if you were viewing like you know part of the screen uh, instead of like all of the screen. I mean, you would work with the information you have, and so so they saw it and they're like, wow. X. That's the big tell, by the way. Anyone who calls Twitter X, those are not real people. Like that is not what it's called. Um, and so we'll be like, look, X is this huge thing, and we've got all these numbers. And look at this clip that Tucker Carlson posted, and it's getting all of these views because they don't track video views the way that like these other streaming platforms or video platforms do. They track it as like one view equals one engagement. So you'd see like a video that's embedded, and it would have like a thousand views, but the impressions would be like a million. It'd be like, look, it's getting a million views. It's crazy. And so they're looking at this, and they're looking at the way Elon is behaving. And just like they saw what was going on with DeSantis, where you've got this guy, he's being covered a certain way in the media, he's making certain moves, they're going to put all their eggs in that basket. They do the same thing. They see a potential for the wind to blow a certain way, and they just put all of their eggs in that basket, and it just like fails spectacularly for them. Because nobody knows what a Twitter space is. Most people aren't even on Twitter. If you like stop and ask someone, are you on Twitter? They're not on Twitter, let alone do they have an idea of what a space is as opposed to a traditional type of like live stream, but this is more democratized. Like This is something that like a 120 IQ, like classical liberal kind of guy is going to think is really cool because it does exactly what they like to do, which is sit around and jerk each other off and talk about <laughs> ideas. That's like Lex Friedman. Like, I just like ideas. Oh, like, you tell me how much you like ideas. I fucking love ideas so much. And we're all going to get together. And we're going to talk about ideas in a Twitter space. And it's so democratized. Anyone can ask a question. And it's like, this is gay, dude. Like, I like Twitter spaces <laughs> as much as the next guy. But give you an example. That was in late May, if I recall correctly. My sister comes into town two weeks later, three weeks later. We go out to dinner, and she's like, so 
what's going on with uh what's going on with like trump and i was like well, what do you mean like i mean i don't know he's running he's like facing indictments or whatever and she was like well you know do you think he's gonna get the nomination and i was like i don't know i mean this desantis is running oh he is keep in mind she's not like completely out of it she has voted for trump twice keeps up with politics more than the average person uh, but she's not on Twitter. And so even she did not know that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis had tossed his hat in the ring. And I remember thinking that was so funny. I tweeted it out. And all the DeSantis people were coming after me. You just made this up. You, It was like, I had one half DeSantis people. You just made this up. And then other half, like, Groypers that were just like, John Doyle kisses his sister. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy. <laughs> yeah, I was getting it from both sides. But, uh, yeah, no, that was, like, completely true. And nobody knew that he had launched that way. And then the launch itself, too was cringe because there were technical difficulties, which they tried to frame as like, oh, it's because it was so popular. I didn't hear anyone talk about it. I heard it covered in the news to the extent that it would be covered if, hey, look, this guy's running for president. But it wasn't like Trump where it dominated the news cycle and continued to dominate the news cycle until still. I mean, literally, we've been in almost a decade of nonstop Trump-related news coverage. And then also, he like people were listening because fucking Elon Musk is in there. Like, I want to listen to Elon Musk. Like, DeSantis was not speaking for the majority of the space. Like, he got it in. He was like, eh, hello, we're going to. And then Elon Musk would talk and people are like, oh, let's listen to this guy. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't cool. You know, no one really, like, wanted to see DeSantis give his announcement. And then when he gave his actual speech, there was no passion, no charisma. He sounded like he was reading words off of a paper that weren't even his words, like some staffer wrote for him on his comms team. But then he didn't deliver them in a way that you would deliver speech when you've got sort of a room to work with and an energy to feed off. Like it sounded like he literally with less energy than we're speaking now. It sounded like he was just sitting somewhere in his audio book. And he was just like, Hello, uh, you know, we're, we're going to uh, choose not to decline. It's like, okay, I didn't know that was on the menu. That's awesome. I didn't know we could just choose not to decline. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, let's let's vote for this guy. So, yeah, it was a, it was a total disaster. Well, here's an important lesson I think this cycle has showed us, and probably some in 2022 as well, is that the internet does not reflect the actual Republican electorate, but especially not Twitter. Because you look at the actual numbers here. I mean, most of our voters are still over the age of 35, a lot of them over the age of 50. If they use the internet at all, if they use social media at all, it's Facebook, maybe a little bit of YouTube, but you know, en masse, they're not using Twitter. They're not using Instagram or TikTok. And I think yeah, that's part of why the DeSantis launch failed. I think that's why a guy like Vivek Ramaswamy, who dominated the internet this cycle, only ended up with, what, like 7% in Iowa? Because <coughs> that's just sort of the truth here. And I think you've seen a lot of candidates. Obviously, social media is important, and it reaches a lot of voters. But in some ways... I think we also sort of live in our own echo chamber here. When you knock on the average doors, for instance, in Iowa, they're not using Twitter. You know, we even talk about the DeSantis influencers in the reverse. I don't think either way they impacted the election a whole lot because I don't think most people saw or heard what they were doing. Most of them got their information from Fox News and, like I said, maybe a little bit of Facebook. And, uh, you know, that maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe we don't want that. But for the next couple decades i think it's still going to be like that and maybe there's a day when we all get older and like our mediums become the norms of america but i don't think that's true at least for the gop still you're definitely getting arrested for all this anti-desantis talk after this they're coming straight to your house i've th think i think i've thought a, a lot about a couple guys i know it's more than a couple i'd say and a couple guys that i'm friends with that have really gone into this, um, you know, Trumpers are like a, a cult and everything and nobody will criticize anything he says. Have you guys noticed how this has sort of become like an ecosystem? And what do you think about it? Because I see, and I'll name one person that I think has gone back and forth. And I think that's been Cernovich over the years. I mean, he, he's gone back and forth in his support for Trump for better or for worse. But there's other people who just are really hardcore into this space now of, you know, nobody who supports Trump can face any criticism. They can't. Uh, address the fact of the swamp and of the vaccine and all this other stuff, and it's really become a bit of their, a bit of their driving force in their content. And I kind of wonder what you guys think about the idea where people can be 
and I think John, you're particularly good at this, not doing the brother wars type of things. Do you think this is a like a wise move for people in this in this space, or do you think that's just you know to each their own sort of deal? But I, I see a lot of people moving into this territory where it's like it's they think it's more effective for them to call out their own side ninety five percent of the time. Yeah, I mean, there's just a profound narcissism with the way that the sphere exists now, uh, and because of social media, like. You're not a part of a news broadcast or a company necessarily or a publication. You are, you know, a streamer or a YouTuber or a tweeter or something. And so your incentive is to drive attention and clicks to your individual brand. Um, and a lot of people get involved in politics because they want to move the ball down the field. But a lot of people get involved in politics because they wanted to be comedians or actors or something and they couldn't cut it because they're not talented. So they wash up into right wing politics. And they have a problem with, like, for example, if everybody is saying, you know, Donald Trump is good because X, Y, Z, if I'm the guy who goes against the grain and says, um, actually, Operation Warp Speed, whatever, well, now I can get some eyeballs because, oh, look at this guy. He's saying something different. And so there was a strong incentive for several years, uh, we'll say between fortification and maybe even just recently, to look for an alternative to Trump. Uh, be that DeSantis. And for a while, even a lot of the people who weren't exactly excited about being pro-Trump again, they started to be pro-Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, um, and, but they weren't exactly embracing Trump. And it's because they like they look at the sort of cult-like behavior that does surround Trump because he's a man that can inspire that sort of loyalty. And they view it to be low status. They view it to be you know unsophisticated. And so to sort of separate themselves from that they like to say, well, I'm actually a free thinker and I don't buy into that stuff or whatever. And it's difficult to discuss that with these people because like when they say, oh, well, how, how can you support Trump when he still stands by the vaccine? There are like five separate tunnels of thought that we have to explore and I have to hold their hand and walk with them down. I can show them how I can still do that. They think it's as simple as, oh, I just never thought of that. And it's like, look, who else in that position? I mean, the amount of pressure, you're talking about like a global operation. Who else, when put in that position, uh, would have done something differently? I mean, would DeSantis have done something differently? I mean, having even deeper swamp ties, global ties, whatever, than Trump does. Who would have actually resisted that? That's like the one part. Second part is like, dude, if you got the vax, like honestly, like at this point, it's like not it's really... You made a choice, okay? Like a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people made their choices. Like you're you're focusing too much on an issue that the general public has pretty much moved past, honestly. And the DeSantis campaign experimented with that, trying to legislate this anti-COVID stuff so this can never happen again. People just weren't buying it. Like I agree, it sucked. These people should be held accountable. We should have a our own version of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But the general public has more or less moved on from that. So there's just a really strong incentive for people to refuse to hand in their cool card, join the team, work to move the ball down the field, because they personally benefit more from offering people something that's fresh, something that's contrarian, something that's blah, blah, blah. And that's why you see so many people, for example, spending their days this week tweeting about how Taylor Swift is actually uh, a big psyop that is this sort of Hail Mary play by the Democrats to keep Brandon in office. And it's like stuff like that, that is actually retarded. But they do that because they know, oh my gosh, look at this, because conservatives love the conspiracy theories. We love it. And the, everything that happened with COVID gave us a license to just believe all of it. And it's a beautiful format, because if I'm out there saying that this is a psyop, this is a psyop, I've got heightened perception. And if you don't go along mm -hmm. with it, it's either because you don't have that heightened perception, you don't know the things I know, or you're paid off. You're paid off by Taylor Swift. That's why you're disagreeing. Or you're a simp. That's why you're disagreeing or something like that. So the whole sphere is like this labyrinth of retardation. <laughs> you can only truly transcend from if you listen to Vince Dow, Radical Politics, John Doyle, and <laughs> says. But everyone else who's not doing that, I, I pity them to a certain extent. But also it's like they, they choose to continue to exist in this labyrinth. They simply have to look up and climb above and see what could be uh, on the horizon in front of them. Yeah, we don't see people on the left doing this either. And that's another thing you rarely see. I mean, sometimes you will see people put pressure on Biden or whatever, and that we know. And I'm not against criticism. I'm not against putting pressure on people on our side to do the right thing. But it reaches a point where if you're going to spend all of your time 
criticizing somebody like Trump over something like COVID when their preferred candidate also supported the vaccine, shilled it publicly 1,600 times, according to the aforementioned Miss Plastic, and just goes on and on. If you look at his record, he praised Fauci. He did all this. They want to sweep that under the rug. They want to go out here in regards to Trump and just attack him. All it's doing is weakening Trump. It's, it's just weakening the base, and you don't see that on the left. That's why the left has been winning, but so many people on the right, when push comes to shove, they're unable to fall in line. They're unable to get in line, and they wonder why the right keeps losing. It's partially, not only, but partially because of stuff like this. Well, on John's point, too, about, uh, you know, serious people trying to move the ball down the field. Think about that. If you were a DeSantis guy who really cared about the greater cause, the countries, the policies, all that stuff, then you would probably honestly do what Ron DeSantis himself did and say, look, you know, we campaigned, we tried, but ultimately Trump and DeSantis shared 90% of the policies in terms of like, if you actually went through their platform for 2024, you'd realize they're more or less identical. And you would say, okay, well, whatever my shortcomings, my criticisms of Trump, ultimately he's going to be the nominee. He's going to be the guy. Let's try to use him as the vehicle to advance what I ultimately want. But if you, like John said, were just uh, some attention hungry, failed actor influencer who just your whole life was crying online for attention, then you would do exactly what they were doing the past couple of weeks, which is just act scorned and bitter about Trump and just still keep tweeting about him. And, you know, in, instead of trying to be mature and actually decide how to act in the best interest of the country, but you know, that they're incapable of that because that's ultimately not their goal. He's got somebody on his mind when he's saying failed actor. Complaining a lot of, less. You know, not even, it's I just all of them, dude. Said, yeah. It is all, right. all of them. It's all of the talking heads and it's all of the influencers, the e-girls. If you ask around, you go get drinks with people, you find out like where these people came from. Like, wait a minute, this person was like a literal nobody. Now all of a sudden they're being promoted by these organizations. They all have a story like that. And that's why I am very grateful that I had the upbringing that I had and the sort of experiences that I had because you know I was never captain of the football team, but like everybody sort of knew who my friends and I were because we were always doing things that were playfully bigoted and silly, you know, <laughs> always up to no good. And so I'm used to kind of like people knowing who I am and getting mad at me and getting attention. And so when I started, you know, growing on social media, I, I feel like I could handle that pretty well. Some people can't. It literally melts their brain and they start behaving in ways in public at these events. And I'm going to write a memoir about it. The things I have seen are insane. It is insane behavior and it needs to be discussed at some point because these people, it's exactly like that. They have this desperation for attention and it doesn't matter where they get it. It's being a stand-up comedian, it's being an actor, it's being a, play, a playwright, or maybe it's just talking about politics in a way that's like just recycled talking points from the George Bush era. It doesn't matter. They just need attention. And that's why anywhere they look, oh, it looks like the media is talking a lot about DeSantis. I'll go there. Oh, it looks like the media is talking a lot about this. I'll go there. That's what the grifter is. They really don't have any conviction. They might be able to rationalize why their opinions have changed so much. Um, but really what it is, is just a desperate, pathetic need for validation and attention. And it's a deep insecurity, which is why you look at me or rep or Vince or any of the guys that we hang out with, any sort of change in opinion they've had has been like a ratchet. I have just gotten more right wing. I have just read more books and been like, oh, true. Let's keep going. I've never pivoted and gone like one way and then totally shift. But a lot of guys do that because they don't really care about a coherent worldview, seeking the truth. They just care about attention and it leads them to do insane things. I can definitely relate to the, um, when I was younger, uh, getting attention for, do, for acting out maybe, uh, for, for being a little bit entertaining, I'll call it. Are you going to grace us with one of the thing, the, one of the alleged bigoted things you did in high school? Uh, I'll say that one time th there was, uh, we got an article written about us in the school newspaper because allegedly uh, there were there were these kids that would sit outside the school and they had sidewalk chalk and they always had like so many different things like they had coming out day they had gay pride oh month my God. whatever so they would draw like gay stuff on the sidewalk uh, with the sidewalk chalk and allegedly the article claims this I don't think this is true but the article claims that an anonymous group of 
uh, boys would walk by the, the kids as they were drawing this homosexual sidewalk propaganda <laughs> and they would dry heave and pretend to vomit uh, and things like that. Just like little <laughs> playful, harmless stuff. Just, and so it was like always like that kind of thing where we're just like being a menace to society. And uh, I, I've always enjoyed that. And so I think it sort of makes sense that that's like literally what I do for a living now. But it was always motivated by sort of like proving that point. Like, no, this isn't normal. No, this isn't going to be accepted or tolerated. Like, it wasn't like we were just, you know, going around being menaces for no reason. There was always like sort of a, a based motive for it. So that was me, cameraman Badan. That's what's so funny too, is because like all like the gay people on Twitter get mad. They're like, John Doyle is like this because he used to get bullied in high school. And I have to <laughs> shut up because it's like, if I start, like, actually, it's like the opposite is what happened. You were the gay one. You're the one who got bullied. And then they're going to like reach out to my old teachers and they're going to find all these like things. And so we just, you know, we can't, we mm. can't get too into that. The but, black uh, face and. No, no, it was never nothing. Never, never right. No, no Trudeau, no Trudeau <laughs> events. I don't know if you guys know about the Trudeau, um, the one blackface where he sang Deo in blackface in a, I think it was a high school talent show. That's uh, one of his, that's my favorite blackface of his personally, <laughs> just singing a song about a guy who works at a banana uh, factory. I don't know. In blackface. My um, favorite blackface story is when Andrew Says came to Dallas and he wanted to go to the batting cages and then he applied blackface and said, look at me, I'm Jackie Robinson. And then he missed all of them. It was fucking, he was in the slow pitch <laughs> bombing. I was like, this is so embarrassing. I hope we don't make the news simply because you're doing so poorly. If you were just like knocking him, hitting dingers, and then he get canceled for blackface, okay, fine, cool. Way to sort of inadvertently show off your baseball skills there. But the fact that he just wasn't even making contact it was tough to watch. <laughs> the The reality of that story is that it was David Ortiz I was impersonating, not Jackie Robinson. Oh, but simple. Left-handed, mistake. yeah. Hey, they all look the same. That's what you always say. Right? Wow. Simple, Unbelievable. Simple <laughs> Cameraman Gabe, eat your heart out. As the person of color of the day there, he would have been very offended. Um, how much of this, if any, of the um, social media hearing from yesterday the day before did you guys see the zuck and all i saw uh new like fox news talk about how it was the biggest thing ever but we've heard that about these social media hearings since probably 2017 so i i don't think it's consequential i don't think it matters i know ted cruz had his moment as he always does ted cruz grills big tech ceo and then <laughs> what happens from it nothing but so I, I don't really care. Like I, I don't. There's some people, you see the views on them that are obsessed with watching congressional hearings. I don't really like to see the debate or whatever, but I never understood it. Here's a bunch of useless people getting their 30 second Twitter clip in for. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's not, literally not do anything. Yeah. It's like what the whatever podcast is to incels. Congressional hearings are to boomers. They're just like, yeah, get him, Ted Cruz. <laughs> you call AOC a stupid communist and the incels are watching whatever. Like, yeah, get him, Andrew Tate. Call her a whore. It's literally like the same thing. It's like this revenge porn fantasy for the, uh, for the disenfranchised, disaffected people of America. Well, you guys are right. When I, I watched a few clips of this last night, and here's Ted Cruz saying uh, this warning screen for you know, content featuring minors was egregious, but uh, pretty much all of it is what it is, is they yell at Mark Zuckerberg and don't let him answer and then blame him for every crime that's committed. Like, yes, like try to prevent uh, trafficking. Yes. Try to prevent like porn spam to teens and everything. But, and I even saw this on some people's stories yesterday being like, Hey, this play, this app is so dangerous for for teens. Look how many how much porn spam I got in my junk folder that doesn't go to my actual inbox and it's clearly separated marked marked by spam and you can delete it all at once. And I'm just sitting there thinking, why are you blaming the Zuck for people, you know, doing bad things? Is it is it really Facebook or Meta's uh problem and well, it's their problem, but is it really their fault? that bad people are using their platform to, you know, try to do these things? Or are these people just going to find whatever one of the most popular mediums is? Now, I did take some solace in the ripping to shreds the guy from TikTok because he's sitting there pro like doing provable lies, just being like, we, we never sent any data back to, to China. There is no other TikTok in China that is that promotes better things. It's actually under a different name in China. Don't tell anybody. 
and we don't do anything wrong. We're just a good, you know, American company, says guy with accent. But that that uh, brings a question for you guys to mind and something that I've done streeters about and before. Uh, do you guys think that TikTok as a platform is any better or worse than it and than any of the other platforms? And the reason I ask that is it because it's worse that it's China getting the information or is it the same as an American company getting the information? Because a lot of the opinions I was combated with in this question, whereas I think, you know, it's not good for... I think it's worse that a foreign entity gets your data. But a lot of the opinions that I was faced with in response to that question was, well, all the other social media platforms are stealing your data anyway. Google knows where you are at any second. You know, Instagram is tailoring things to you based on the marketing data they've taken. Do you guys think that it matters which company it is? Do you think any like sort of TikTok ban would do anything? I, mean, I don't honestly, think it would. Uh, or you want to go ahead? No, no, that's all you. Okay. Oh, no, yeah, I was going to say, honestly, you could make the argument that it's worse that American companies are selling data to our own government than they're selling it to China. What is China going to do with it exactly? Nothing that we already know, and they probably already have the data at this point anyways. Honestly, I'd say TikTok is probably a worse platform for other reasons, just because of the fact that it's probably lowering the attention spans of all the people, mainly those that are like, you know, 15 years old, probably more so than like YouTube or long form content will lower their attention span. But I mean, with YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, all these things, and I mean, we might be a little hypocritical talking about it because I know, you know, I do short form content. I know Vince does too. But um, it's like, yeah, I, I think it's a bad platform, but uh, is it necessarily just because they're sending the data to China? Like, I'm not a fan of that, but it is true that that's kind of a distraction from all of the behavior of the other companies that, A, probably do the same thing, and B, send it to our government and track us, which is probably far more scary. I mean, if you're on Instagram, you probably get ads for things that you like talk about or that you like recently purchased. And there's no way that they would have found that out if they weren't like connected and watching your every move or had access to your bank statements or had access to your microphone, even when you say that they don't get access to it. So yeah, I think that there's a lot of other uh, interesting acts going on with the other platforms too, that are probably more egregious. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't, I can't conceive of a scenario where a foreign government is able to use my information in a way that would harm me more than my own government. Um, like, I can't imagine the Chinese finding out, okay, John Doyle likes to watch people dying in car crashes on TikTok. Uh, let's like use that and try to sell him something. Whereas our government is much more because Chinese, nobody has a good reading of Chinese people. Nobody actually knows anything about Chinese culture, what Chinese people are actually like. They're basically like a race of autistic merchants. They really aren't as <laughs> consumed by the sort of ideology uh, that you see over in the West. And so the people who are in charge of our national security apparatus are going to use that data to create windows to clamp down on American patriots, to do whatever, to sell their information to uh, people who maybe want to steal that information for them, to use it specifically with pernicious intent. But ultimately, like the TikTok ban, insofar as we're supporting that because of data to China, that's not why we want it banned. I think that we want it banned because it is cultivating an environment that promotes degeneracy and incentivizes people to behave in ways that are harmful to the social fabric uh, for young people. Um, and that's not always the case. I know it's sort of a meme where people will be like, TikTok is degenerate. My algorithm is nothing but like girls shaking their ass. And it's like, okay, well, my algorithm is family guy clips. So what are you spending your time watching? So there is an extent to which it is sort of like adjustable. However, it is also true that there is a pipeline that's created because of these social media platforms where there's some TikTok thought who then becomes an OnlyFans thought who then goes on some podcast to promote her OnlyFans, or now she's on Twitter promoting her OnlyFans. Whatever the case may be, instead of doing this political theater where we've got Ted Cruz playing the part of a senator who gives a shit and he's going to grill tech company guy who's playing the part of a tech company guy who is like going to somewhat be held accountable or something, like we could reprimand the head of the FCC. We could like do things that would actually enforce laws on the books about how these tech companies operate what kind of content they can allow on their platform, obscenity, pornography, et cetera. But we don't want to do that. So we just want to do theater and LARP. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, you would need somebody who's going to actually prioritize this type of content being eliminated from the social media sphere, uh, which even under a Trump administration, I don't think would be prioritized. Uh, but in the meantime, you're still going to see, I think, a continuation of this because, dude, it's ever like kids, these kids and their phones. I mean, the screen time, it's just, it's crazy. It's absolutely bonkers how much time these kids are spending just scrolling all day. Well, one of the things that I think people have brought up that they're worried about is what's actually caused a few sewer sides with some uh, good American boy youth is that they get suckered in by some fake profiles. Now, these are usually like Nigerians, to be to be quite honest, West African accounts, at least the ones that I've read about, is that they say, hey, I'm a hot chick and send me some compromising photos of you. And then the guy says, actually, my name is whatever from uh, Lagos. And if you don't send me $3,000, I'm going to spread around these these photos of you. Now, I would imagine that the Chinese would be able to, you know, stem and farm that sort of thing out there on behalf of their government to people who may, you know, be involved in politics. Let's say you're one of these staffers on a on a DeSantis or Vivek or Trump campaign, and you're stupid enough to, to fall for one of these things, and then all of a sudden the Chinese government's got pictures of you from, like, here, right? Like this angle. Uh, while you're naked or something. So I think that's the sort of thing that people are referring to when they talk about TikTok, but it can come from anywhere else in the world, I suppose. But I think um, particularly um, with China being able to do that, it would, I don't know, would it somehow or another be able to affect the elections? But I, I, I don't know if John Podesta is going to do that to me either. You know what I mean? I feel like at that point, you should just stand by it. Like if you're being, <laughs> seriously, if you're being blackmailed, like we're going to release this material, you gain favor on your side. If you come out publicly and you're like, Hey, I'm at threat of being blackmailed. I'm releasing what I'm doing myself. And just letting you know, these are the threats that are out there. Dude, if there was like a congressman who was at risk of having pictures of his, uh, his appendage leaked and he came out and just straight up posted one on Twitter by himself. And he were like, I stand with the American people. You're telling me that guy wouldn't just be permanent incumbent in Congress. You're telling me that guy wouldn't headline CPAC next time. That would be like, like that's like the kind of spine I want in my leadership. Like, yeah, no, hell yeah. Nobody else wants to jump in on that. Let me ask you guys. Is that about wrong? Some... What do you want to cuck to the Chinese Communist Party? You want to no. The Democrat plantation. I just, just don't know. My thing is, is, you know, is that going to work for every side though? Like whether I agree with it or not, which I think would be hilarious. I'm not going to be like, how dare you, sir? But is, is that going to work for every side? And it really depends on the seriousness of the person. Because I know that you guys, just like I do, know people who do commentary and videos and whatnot who aren't willing to be a part of saying certain things they aren't willing to be in certain conversations that are too risque because of how seriously they take themselves and cater themselves to an audience throughout the rest of the time like there's yeah. obviously there's comedians on one side who can talk about anything then there's serious political commentators who can't even criticize you know like uh surrogacy or whatever the topic of the day is because of who their audience is on whichever platform so i don't think that's going to work for everybody if you work for cnn and didn't that what didn't that happen to one guy you got caught well, <laughs> no, didn't he get his shot yeah. back he was no, right. He got he got, he I think, got suspended, fired. and then I think he got fired for something else short after. So okay. it was during a Zoom call, wasn't it? That he was yeah. Uh, so because like the left, they have no shame. I mean, like even the gay guy who got caught uh, like producing pornography of himself in the Senate, even he was like celebrating it still after. And then you know the the leftist media ran defense for him. But on the right, if you're somebody who, as you alluded to, doesn't really care about the issues anyway, then I can understand that. But if you are a young man who is genuinely just trying to enact change, move the ball down the field, and you find out that the Chinese Communist Party is harvesting pictures of your PP, you <laughs> need to make a stand and say that we will not bow down to communist tyranny. And I don't know. I'm just saying, if I woke up one morning and one of these guys just like came out ahead of it and posted, that would be like, you know, isn't that a Black Mirror episode? Like he does it and then it turns out it was all a bluff anyway. Yeah, just be like the guy in Black Mirror. Never seen it. Can't say I have. A, can't say I know that episode. I wanted to um, 
if if it had to ruin my life hearing about what Seth MacFarlane's real views are, then I'm gonna have to ruin y'all's life uh, hearing him on, you know, on Bill Maher. He comes across really just as uh, a guy who never gets disagreed with, and that makes sense. He's a cajillionaire, but he really comes across as um, early 2000s, late 2000s, fratty internet writing, and not in the good way. It's sort of just like "fuck you, man." Don't you don't you align with this progressive point, or are you just a, an idiot? Like that sort of thing. Like I'm. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the old site called Cracked.com, or maybe you could compare it to like an older Vice, how they progressed into a super left-wing outlet. It's sort of like that, where like they try to put this coarse, really, um, really rigid commentary on a on a popular topic, on a serious topic, and then basically just add in like f bombs and everywhere to sound cool. So that's basically how I took uh, Seth MacFarlane to be here. Let's watch a little bit of this, and hopefully it doesn't get taken down by Bill Maher. Never speak about our president that way. But when you're 82 years of age, it's not it's not offensive to say you're no longer a spring chicken and you don't seem to have the level of five and, and the energy that you want you to have. And so you take that into consideration. This is insane. I agree. OK, that's why people vote for Trump, mm -hmm. because there's stuff like that on the left that people just go. Uh, I'm talking know about men, women, sports. It's horrible. But separating by sports by sex makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And if you think it doesn't, uh, you can't leave the country. And that's Completely cutting good. off your nose to spite your face. Uh, okay, okay. okay. Well, I'm just, I'm just giving you the answer to the question you're asking all night long. Why do they vote for Donald Trump? It's not always because they like him. No, it's because stuff like that well, is kookier. To people, them. people, and there's lots of. It's kookier cool. than and, trashing the Capitol. What the fuck? It well, thinking, I, I, thinking, I, I, think. I, I, in a way, it is. How is it? It's, it's apples and oranges. It's apples and oranges. One is more evil. One is one is more horrible. But thinking that, I mean, what would happen if we combine the WNBA and the NBA? No, please. Well, LeBron would go from averaging 25 to averaging 70. <laughs> because half the team, I mean, you mix it up and he'd hold the ball it's just, it's and create just, the mismatch just, and take just, advantage just of the mismatch. You're both, you're both right. And it's, I, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you something like, I, I, when you donate to the Democratic Party, which I have, you get to do certain things. And I, I got to. I didn't get even a, get a thank you. I gave him a million dollars <laughs> twice. I didn't get a I, um, I got on a can Zoom. I just say thank you. Thank yeah, you very yes, much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I got on a Zoom with Biden for like 10 minutes. Well, you, can, you can talk to Biden for 10 minutes alone. Like, okay, great, wow. That was AI Biden. <laughs> <laughs> that was not Biden. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, it wasn't AI Biden. <laughs> right. um, but but the, the, what I took away from that was that, oh, this guy is not the world's greatest public speaker, but right. I'm now getting why people like Lindsey Graham are defending him and saying, like, if you don't like Joe Biden, there's something wrong with you, which you can look it up. He did, he did say, I'm paraphrasing because I've right. had 100 drinks. But, <laughs> but he, did, he did essentially say that, like, if you don't like Joe Biden as a person, there's something wrong with you. You need to look yourself in the mirror. But there's a flip side. And here's the flip side. You can like Joe Biden, but hate Capitol Hill. As of it, course. As, as, is, as it has been for so many years. When you look at people, think about Trump. You ever watch Trump debate? This is why I was joking around and said I challenge him to debate. What would I have beyond. to worry about? He doesn't say. Listen, Vince, this is a freedom cast. All right, yeah. nobody's gonna take us down. Like, I understand. Okay, it's called call a gish gallop. I, I understand. It's that. when but you does disseminate so much bullshit, you're like Biff in Back to the right. Future, getting right. fucking <laughs> dumped on hey, by hey, the manure hey, truck. Like, it yeah. So Seth MacFarlane is really going after Trump hard here. January 6th is the worst thing ever. Um, all he does is, is lie. And it's like, I can't help but think of shades of like Neil deGrasse Tyson, where somebody becomes so popular in the left wing sphere, they feel, you know, obligated to start just pushing out in, insane viewpoints that, I don't know, why do they think that this is a normal thing? Is, is this, you know, you mentioned Twitter not be not everybody being on Twitter, but why does Seth MacFarlane think that it's a normal thing that like January six is the worst thing ever? He couldn't be further from it. Um, it's definitely worse than you know men pretending to be women and taking you know turning society on its side to make you forcibly say that they are women. Where does this like where does this sort of thing come from? Do you guys think? I mean, that's just like libtard theology. Like that's like what they <laughs> believe. That's like just what it is. Um, and I hate that whole genre of content. I mean, because Bill Maher, anybody who 
on a, like say you've got someone who matches Bill Maher in terms of their worldview. Those people are not in the driver's seat. Bill Maher is not in the driver's seat of where the left is going, whether that's in terms of their media narratives, their political trajectory. Bill Maher exists so old school libtards can watch him and still think that they're open-minded. It gives them permission to call themselves that amongst everything else that's going on with the left because occasionally Bill Maher will say, wait a minute, maybe men shouldn't be competing in women's sports. And then they're just like, wow, so true. But then does he talk about the tranny stuff? Does he talk about the child genital mutilation? Anything that's in that same category. And actually, it's like the far more alarming and interesting part of that whole discussion. But I haven't seen him ever speak about that. But it's like the very safe sort of, you know, men probably shouldn't be in women's sports because the institution of women's sports is just so important. We must preserve that. That's where I draw the line. And then it also gives permission to like boomer conservatives to watch Bill Maher and be like, see, some liberals still, you know, we can agree on stuff. Bill Maher's not in the driver's seat. The left is doing what the left is doing. And if anything, that is just like placating what would develop into authentic, real sort of energy and power on the right being like, okay, we're not going to reach these people. I don't care if they agree on the whole women's sports thing. That is like literally in the list of most important issues, maybe not even in like the triple digits uh, in terms of where it's placing. So I think that the whole type of content uh, is horrible. And that's why it's allowed to exist, by the way. That's why Bill Maher keeps getting renewed on HBO. That's why he'll never be canceled, because it is good for them to have somebody out there who is occasionally pushing back on the most inconsequential issues, which they know are insane, because it lends them a little bit of credibility. See, look, we're not just a total echo chamber. We're not completely intolerant. Look, Bill Maher says he doesn't really buy into the whole training stuff with women's sports. It's like, who cares, dude? Ask Bill Maher. Like, and, and by the way, Anything that they espouse on that program, whether it's the black guy, Seth and Farr, talking about why Trump got elected or why they're mad at the Democrats, why they're mad at Capitol Hill, they don't mean that in the sense that, well, they've been doing it this way for so long, now we want to try it the other way. They think that that is just inadequately executed leftism, inadequately executed egalitarianism. They want someone who's going to come in and be Biden, but more left-wing, who's going to do socialism democratically the real way this time. They're libtards. They don't get it. They don't learn from their decisions. They just think, oh, well, it must have not been executed properly because there's no question this is the right thing to do. My worldview is correct. It's simply just not being executed properly. And so they can't yeah. be rehabilitated. Yeah, that's a really good point. I feel like no matter what happens through, in this case, in America's case, democratic governorship, um, that it's never their fault. You know, it's always, you know, remember the white lash and then this is the backlash and, and they're angry because of this and that. And if everything just, get, if they just properly were explained how leftism works and how not being a bigot and being anti-racist works, then they'll just, they'll just calm down. And as long as they make money while it's happening, everything will be fine. And I just wonder, you know, you have the list of examples that goes back to like 2017. It was always brought up Chicago, St. Louis, New York, um, New Orleans, Philadelphia, all these cities that have been run by Democrats for at least 30 years, some, were, some are going up over 50 years. And it's the same things over and over again, but it never is blamed on the actual party governing it. Uh, govern, governing it. And I'm, and I'm not saying all of the Republican leaders in it, that are mayors and governors are always doing the best job of course they're not but in places like california or in chicago which is probably one of the the greater examples or st louis or or uh, memphis if you want to go in that part of the country these are places that are strictly run by democrats and they have very high murder rates very high drug rates very high abortion rates very low uh, medium incomes for a family very little amount of fathers in the households and they just say well as long as it's not a republican or a conservative or something that's different than than liberal it's still going to get better it's still going to correct itself some way do you guys see any sort of you know the 180 on mass happening or is it always going to be this sort of you know 60% of people go for Trump and then for some reason, you know, 800 billion people vote for Biden and this yin and this yang and this back and forth where there is ever, is there ever going to be like this super majority in the government in the United States, do you think? Uh, not right now. I mean, we're looking at this. We're seeing what's happening in the uh, the country. We're very polarized. And when the parties are this far are apart from each other, because one party is just moving left off a cliff and the other party sometimes will 
you know, take a stand, but like cave in to the social issues five years after the fact. It's like, yeah, I mean, this is kind of just a controlled shift uh, off a cliff in, in really in terms of what we're seeing. So I don't think it's going to really come to a point where we're going to have these epic landslide victories for either party for quite some time, mainly just because of the uh, current state of affairs. Um, and that's kind of just the way we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, uh, be, I mean, even if you ask those people, like the people who are voting for Democrat, let's, let's say uh, the Canadians who are living in Chicago who are voting for Democrats, they think that the reason they have so many issues with crime and poverty is, again, inadequately executed leftism. They think that the reason, even the ones who are honest enough to acknowledge the issue uh, that Black America has with crime, if they even acknowledge that that's a real thing, they will Canadian then say, America. well, it's because, so true, Vince, it's because they're not getting enough funding per pupil in the schools. It's because they're not um, getting enough money and then they have to commit these crimes because all criminals are like Aladdin, where they're just stealing bread because they're starving. <laughs> and it's like that. And most people are done thinking after one lily pad. Most mm -hmm. people will think once and then, ha, done it, submitted it, clocking out, done for the day, back to just brain rot. Like I saw this yesterday where I'm, you know, defending Taylor Swift and I was talking about how white women are the most likely race of all women to vote for Republicans. I don't know why we're trying so hard to distance ourselves from Taylor Swift, from the Bar Barbie movie, which were the two strongest symbols of female white identity that we saw this year. It'd be one thing if we were neutral, but we are actively trying to just distance and denigrate that whole thing. And it's just like stupid and counterproductive. And I had someone say, uh, why are you pandering to women? We should just repeal the 19th Amendment. And it got like 200 likes in reply. To, it wasn't a ratio, but it was still a couple hundred likes. And I read that and I was like, oh, I didn't even. OK, yeah, let's just repeal the 19th Amendment. Awesome. I had no idea. I didn't know we could just do that. And it's like people like that, they think once and they're like, hmm, oh, just repeal the 19th Amendment. Problem solved. And you can be done thinking. But it's like, how do you do that? How do you create, I mean, we're in a democratic society. How do you convince women to abdicate or not even abdicate to completely just eliminate their own right to vote? I mean, it's never going to happen. So anyways, it's just things like that where people will see, you know, the crime that's in Democrat run cities being committed by uh, the Democrat base. And they'll say, well, this happens because Republicans refuse to play ball and they refuse to give the schools the funding that they need, the social workers the funding that they need. And even if you told them, well, OK, actually, these schools receive more money per student than schools in much safer neighborhoods with much uh, better performing students, et cetera, et cetera. How do you square that? If you can like sit these people down and really just like hammer them on these things, you will reach the end of the conversation and it will be, well, I just have to do more research. There is no you can't convince these people. They have to experience something independently of you that allows them to have an honest conversation with themselves um, it, it, because there's too much pride and there's too much ego and there's too much narcissism to have your mind changed because they view politics as something that's like fun and interesting. And it's, it's like a way of like posturing status or intelligence or something. Um, they don't view it in more practical, important terms. And so that's all it is. It makes them feel good to say the reason that black people commit 60% of the murders in this country is because the stupid Republican controlled Department of Education is not increasing per pupil grants uh, by 5% over a two year period. And that's why that discrepancy exists. And they believe these things because they're libtards. <laughs> Vince, I want to ask you and John come back into this is what's your take on the whole Taylor Swift and Barbie? Like I see them being like the number one beacons for right wing women, or at least women who identify more with conservatism. And, and they're definitely, you know, drawn to Taylor Swift and drawn to Barbie as I think millions of hundreds of millions of women across the world are. But then there's also like Taylor Swift literally campaigns for Democrats. She literally exp espouses views that are contrary to what I think most people listening to this beliefs are. And then you got the Barbie movie, which, you know, has a, a fat Barbie, a trans Barbie, and all these things that are supposed to be against what Barbie uh, actually stands for. What's your take on that? Do you think that we should, you know, leave it alone, let them have it? Or do you think like, you know, shake the person and be like, don't you see what you're actually going for here? Well, I never saw the Barbie movie, so I can't really speak on that. But in terms of uh, Taylor, I mean, I look at her and say that, in my opinion, when you compare 
her influence to what a lot of other girls in Gen Z will say are listening to or finding like they look up to. I actually think she is one of the least bad people in Hollywood all around, if that sort of makes sense. Like, I don't really go oh, listening to her music or whatever. I'm not a Swifty, but I, I think that the conservative outrage towards her, and I think John is sort of right about this, is just this theme of it's easy to put down white women and it's easy to attack white girls and anything they like, right? Um, but, you know, overall, it's like, I could also make the case that she's one of the only people in Hollywood who never had plastic surgery. She has actual musical talent, unlike a lot of other characters in Hollywood. And I mean, the message she's promoting, I'm not saying it's good, but it's also not the worst in Hollywood either. I mean, it's no sexy red or anything like that. So ultimately, I mean, I don't think it's super productive for conservatives to spend so much time dunking on taylor swift i don't know what exactly it's about why it's so there this fixation with it like i said i think it just boils down to white girls are a soft target it's easy to attack them for whatever they like taylor swift starbucks whatever um but you know but i will say at the same time yeah she is still kind of part of that music industry hollywood machine i'm sure in 2024 she will get behind Biden and try to influence young voters to some degree. And obviously we should push back on that. But at the same time, does it mean that her entire popularity is some type of psyop? No. Now, will she, as she is someone powerful, will she be approached by the other people in power and say, hey, I get behind Biden and all that stuff? I'm sure that's going to happen. But it's just interesting that conservatives, instead of saying, okay, then we need an alternative to that, right? Call up all the, the guys that young men like, right? Call up Nelk, call up all like the YouTube people, maybe some of the rappers, whatever, and say, okay, if, if Taylor's going to go campaign for Biden, let's get all the other Gen Z people that are on our side to get with us. Uh, you know, they're not going to do that. They're just going to complain on Twitter and I don't know, whatever it is and I guess, Andrew, you are right. I mean, this perception that every girl who likes Taylor Swift is a liberal, that's just not true. I, I, I guarantee you probably half of the young girls my generation who are conservative also like her. She's just sort of this popular singer, and uh, I don't know if there's more to it than that. I don't think she exists as a Pentagon psyop necessarily. <laughs> John, what do you think about that, about like the idea that, you know, I see conservative female influencers touting Taylor Swift, but then they're going to hate somebody else who promotes, you know, a democratic chairs campaign. Or I see somebody, some of these girls saying, um, you know, tranny this tranny that, but Barbie's got a tranny in the movie and there, and, but that's fine. How do you, how, how do we recognize a misunderstanding of how women operate? Like, do you really think that women are even digesting media to a degree that would really like shift their view on the trans stuff because there was one like in a Barbie movie? They like the Barbie movie because they want to get dressed up in pink and put on their little cowboy boots and their hat and go see it with their friends. They like Taylor Swift because it's relatively wholesome music. It's the same thing. You guys need to hone in your friend enemy detectors, okay? When I went to go see Oppenheimer and I see all of these blonde white women wearing pink cowboy hats and uh, white cowboy boots, going to see the Barbie movie, I was like, wait a minute, friend, friend detected. Same thing with the Taylor Swift concerts. It's filled with white women. They're, you know, they're dressed immodestly and degenerately in the sense that they're wearing like a tank top or whatever. But you look at what's going on in other types of movies. You look at what's going on at rap concerts, some of these other pop concerts. It's far worse. The subject matter is far worse. And that's what I was trying to tell people on Twitter. It's like, look, the billboard said that Taylor Swift is the top pop star of 2023. Number four was Ice Spice. Ice Spice just put out a song called Think You the Shit Fart. And the whole song <laughs> is like the stupid, it's literally, it made me want to just, it was like the worst thing I've ever seen. Because when Taylor Swift came up, like Vince said, I mean, the industry is going to sort of decide to a certain extent who's popular, who's not. But Taylor Swift came up at a time where it was still okay for white girls who were normal to be pop stars. Now, if you want to break into that, you got to be someone like Billie Eilish, who makes music that is worse than what Taylor Swift does, even if she comes out and says that, like, yeah, it was bad that she was watching pornography one time. But still, the content of the music is far worse. I'm not really personally offended by Taylor Swift saying that, you know, my ex-boyfriend did this. I want to be a girl boss this. Women get these silly little 
all ideas in their head. You can't take them seriously. That's where people are making their mistakes. And also, a government plant? Fucking Tom DeLonge was campaigning for John Kerry in 2004. The guitarist from Blink. Like, this has been going on forever. Celebrities campaigning for libtards. Like, this is just how the game is played. But the incentive is to look at, like, a, a you know a Kroger magazine end cap and be like, it's all Taylor Swift. What's going on? Yeah. Famously influential institution of magazine stands at fucking Kroger. Like, dude, this is going to flip the vote. Brandon staying in office. And so what this will allow them to do, because obviously she's going to campaign for Democrats. That's what people do. They're going to just screenshot, told you, screenshot, told you, this is what I was warning you. And everyone's going to be like, oh my gosh, this guy is so smart. He's a visionary. We have to follow him and listen to what he has to say. <laughs> Do they have an alternative? Do they say, man, maybe this is a psyop. Maybe she is an asset. We have to do something else. Do what? Like, no, they don't. All they can do is complain. They don't actually want to fight it because ultimately they don't really care if she is campaigning. They care about furthering and elevating their own brand, their own platform. And they do that by being retarded and claiming that anything that's popular is actually an asset. It's like what I said at the beginning. Is everyone's going in this direction? Um, actually, it's a psyop. Actually, she's an asset. And they will be vindicated on that in the sense that they will post a photo of her speaking at like a Biden rally or something, or probably even something less than that. She'll just say, like, vote for Biden. Ha ha ha. And they'll be like, this is what I was warning you about. The CIA commissioned this. And everyone will be like, oh my gosh, you're so right, Jack Posobiec. But it's like, this <laughs> is not what's happening. Rep, to play counter or to play devil's advocate uh, between these two points, um, it, could you not argue against John and say, well, these um, celebrities, even if they're, you know, on the higher end of acceptability like Taylor Swift, does it not, you know, include itself? Is it not part of a large cog in a machine of propaganda that's generally pushing women towards one direction when the messaging is all about one thing. So yeah, she, she's just one lady who, who girls happen to like, but there's a thousand other ones that also have, you know, maybe it's subliminal, maybe it's outright messaging in their content, which is like, Hey, be left wing. Hey, uh, drug dealing and all this stuff. Granted, she's not doing that, but does it lend itself to the argument that that is also, you know, just another piece of the propaganda machine? Or do you think it's more towards what Vince is saying? Hey, instead of giving this, you know, person who's not that bad, all the, all of your time and, de and demonizing her, how about bringing in something of your own? How about br bringing another person into the fold and, and creating your own thing for people to go at to as an alternate rather than let's say a black hole sucking you into despair of negativity? Well, I mean, I kind of just think that people are making a bigger deal out of it than it needs to be. I mean, you have a celebrity, a celebrity who is popular and who has endorsed Democrats in the past, and it did not move the needle. And she's more likely than not going to go out there, endorse Biden, support Biden. And the same way that LeBron James and Beyonce and Rihanna and Katy Perry and all these people who were very popular back in 2015, 2016, endorsed Hillary Clinton. And you have a lot of people in Ohio who probably like LeBron James, but Ohio as a state moved significantly to the right despite their favorite celebrity endorsing Hillary Clinton. So I think that people in general just don't care that much about these celebrity endorsements or whatever. But I will say this, if we as a movement are going to be so fixated on running against somebody like a a Swift who's like popular instead of actually running against somebody that we're running against, which is Biden. I mean, yeah, and we lose focus. It's going to be a pretty big problem. Um, but in short, I just think that overall, it's not going to move the needle. I agree with John that a lot of people are just trying to be pseudo intellectuals about this whole thing and act like, Hey, I told you first, I told you first, she's going to get out here, do X, Y, and Z. And, and that's going to, get Biden reelected. And it's like, okay, well, like, what exactly are you going to do to stop Biden get, getting reelected, except whining about somebody endorsing Biden, who we know for sure already is going to endorse Biden. There's just nothing else to it. It's not really worth our time. It's like, you can critique certain elements of the music industry. Obviously, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying there's no connections you know, she's a very popular individual. If she was going to be somebody who happened to, you know, be an outspoken conservative or whatever, 
she probably would not have been able to get to that point. I mean, that is true. But at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, it's it's not really going to move the needle. She's not even that outwardly political as a whole. And when she's been in the past, people have not listened a whole lot. I mean, she did a voter registration drive back in 2020. I think the statistics showed that it netted like seven to 8,000 new voters. And we don't even know how they voted. So who really knows? Yeah, it was like seven or 8,000 uh, out of like 100 million person reach or something, John. Even somebody like Fergie was putting out <laughs> worse music than what Taylor Swift oh, was yeah. putting out like 15, 20 years ago. And it's like I said on Twitter, women vote based on feelings and vibes. I remember having conversations <laughs> with women in 2016, and they said that they like Marco Rubio. I said, why? He's cute. Why do you think they waited their October surprise, what was going to sink the Trump ship? in 2016 was a secret recording of Donald Trump having a conversation that every normal man in his life has had at some point because they knew that women would be like, well, I don't like it when men talk about women that way because they think we're objects. What that does is it brings them back to when Chad treated them poorly when they were in college and it resurfaces that trauma and it manipulates them into voting for Hillary Clinton. Like they understand how the game is played. They understand that women vote based on their vibes and things like that. I'm a, you know, if Donald Trump came out and he said that white guys who don't have uh, uh, blue eyes or green eyes who have like brown eyes are stupid. They're the worst I've ever seen. Like, would that kind of hurt my feelings a little bit? Yeah, honestly, but I would still vote for him. Like, I don't care. As long as you're good on the issues, I will vote for you. I don't care if your rhetoric is like personally off putting or something, but women do. And that's what sways them. And so I wasn't even saying that we need to go be like Taylor Swift conservatives. We need to go be Barbie movie conservatives. I'm just like, okay, why can't we just stay out of it? Why are we trying so hard to distance ourselves from the Barbie movie, from Taylor Swift, two things that the women who are the most likely to vote for us, which huh, women voting, cringe, we need it, okay? I understand <laughs> the problem, but this is how the game is played now. And we have to understand that and not just try to like outbaste each other because we want the most clicks on twitter.com. We have to be real and pragmatic. And again, we could just be neutral. We could just stay out of it. We could even maybe be unfavorable, but to spend days crapping on these things achieves nothing for us it, it just alienates us from these women because it gives them the ick it makes us look out of touch that's Brutal. what that's why young women don't want to vote for conservatives they don't really care about the issues what they care about is like no we don't do things that way you guys are lame you guys are cringe like think of the song like girls just want to have fun and find a way to bottleneck your politics into that that is how you get white women to vote for you that's funny it's literally true it's true I, yeah I, i'm the not only women, the only women who disagree with true. This are you know the type kind of women we all know who they are they're the ones who are upset because well i'm not like that well i'm you know, whenever and it's like okay i get it yes i know you're so special you're so unique you're so well read but this is just the reality of the situation um and i'm they allowed know that, to laugh john okay i know well i'm just saying it's true it's funny but it's true it's funny but it's true so yeah Okay, we're going to say goodbye to the... We're going to say hello to the Patreon people right now. And we'll say goodbye to the, the free people uh, right now. Anybody want to wave? Uh, three, two, one, everybody wave. All right, great. Um, bye, broke boys. Bye what, boys? Broke boys. Bro. <laughs> um, I want to... Bro says Patreon. Starting out with straight facts. Uh -huh. I don't lie in my raps. Uh -huh. Hunter Biden smoke. Uh -huh. The Democrats know that. Uh -huh. Biden ain't win jack. Uh -huh. Name is Barack, uh -huh. he a little bee like the pack.